Thank you, Emma. Good afternoon and welcome to the Thought Leadership event series number 23. In this series, we proudly present talks by Western Sydney University researchers whose work aligns with the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals. Today's topic is Teasing Eve, Sexual Harassment of Women in Dhaka City, Bangladesh in the era of rape culture, misogyny and slacktivism by our distinguished speaker, Dr. Arunima Kishore Das. Dr. Das joined the School of Humanities and Communication Arts as an associate lecturer in April 2023 after completing her PhD in the same discipline. Over nine, sorry, her teaching and research interests include the critical theorization of race, racism and multiculturalism, gendered space, migration, gender-based violence, feminism, and digi digital media campaigns. Over 90% of women who use public transport in Dhaka, Bangladesh, have experienced some form of sexual harassment during their commute. Despite this alarming figure, few studies have explored women's experiences of sexual harassment, the effectiveness of NGO initiatives, and how women are taking action. By combining qualitative surveys and social media analysis, Dr. Dust investigates women's experiences of sexual harassment on public transport, their views on women's rights and gender relations, and how they use social media to raise awareness. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Arunima Kishore Das. Over to you. Welcome everyone to my presentation. I'm extremely delighted to be here and would like to express my gratitude to Western State Library and especially Emma and Bhadra for inviting me to deliver this lecture. This lecture today is based on my PhD research that I completed last year. I am now working on writing a book proposal to convert my thesis into a book, so any feedback from the audience on my work will be highly appreciated. Before I delve into the discussion of my research, I would like to start by acknowledging that we are, uh, I am delivering this lecture on unceded Darug land and I would like to pay my respect to all Aboriginal elders, past, present and emerging. Uh, I would like to acknowledge that this land has always been Aboriginal land and always will be Aboriginal. My study, the title of my study is Teasing It, Sexual Harassment of Women in Dhaka City, Bangladesh in the Era of Rape Culture, Misogyny and Slacktivism. This study basically explores the diverse dimensions of the problems of sexual harassment on public buses in Dhaka. In doing so, the study critically examined women commuters' narratives of sexual harassment, NGO-led sexual harassment prevention interventions, and women activists' contemporary autonomous social media initiatives to address sexual harassment of women on public buses in Dhaka. To gain a comprehensive understanding of a feminist study on sexual harassment of women in Bangladesh, it is essential to delve into the socio-cultural uh, patriarchal no. context of the country no, no, no. where the research was conducted. The images you see on the slide are depictions of real-life struggle of getting into a public transport in Dhaka city of Bangladesh. Dhaka, the capital of Bangladesh, is an overpopulated city and can hardly meet the need of adequate public transport for its inhabitants. As a result, sexual harassment on public transport is a very common event in the country. A study by Brack, the largest NGO in the world, shows that 94% of women in Bangladesh experience sexual harassment on public transport. In terms of geographical location, Bangladesh is situated in the eastern part of the Indian subcontinent and it has received its independence in 1971 after being colonized by both England and Pakistan. The patriarchal, patrilineal and patrilocal social systems in Bangladesh highly values public-private divide. 
This results in a gender division of labor and women's role within the household as mothers, wives, and daughters determine their feminine identity, which is tied to the entrenched cultural notions of respectability. Therefore, my study explores the complex relationship between the cultural constructions of respectable femininity and the prevalence of sexual harassment of women in Bangladesh. Although the overall situation of women in Bangladesh has improved since considerably since its independence, gender inequalities have persisted. The high levels of violence experienced by women inside the home and in public sphere reveal the extent of gender inequality in Bangladeshi society. The sexual harassment of women in public spaces is a clear expression of gender inequality in Bangladeshi society. A survey shows that 43% of female respondents are sexually harassed in public spaces, mostly on streets, in markets, and public transport. However, as women's modesty is highly prioritized in patriarchal Bangladeshi society, before 2009, laws that criminalize sexual harassment provided only a very vague definition of sexual harassment as acts that violate a women's modesty. Moreover, as sexuality and use of the terms of sex and sexuality remain a taboo in Bangladeshi society, sexual harassment is often trivialized, excused, and normalized. Patriarchal mainstream media in Bangladesh mostly publishes the news of sensationalized cases of violence against women, including rape, gang rape, acid attacks, domestic abuse, leading to homicide. In contrast, Incidents of sexual harassment that women experience on public buses every day are not considered extreme or sensational enough to be covered in either print or audiovisual media. However, as explained before, many women in Bangladesh experience sexual harassment. And in fact, a recent 2018 report showed that at least 21 women were either raped or gang raped on public transportation across the country between January 2017 and February 2018. While similar statistics of sexual harassment and rape occurring on public buses are available, there is a scarcity of qualitative analysis of women's commuters' sexual harassment narratives in contemporary research on sexual harassment in Bangladesh. Studies on gender and public transport in Bangladesh primarily illustrate the problem of sexual harassment by showing statistics of harassment, but they have largely failed to analyze sexual harassment narratives of women in relation to their class, age, and religious identities. Therefore, my study documents how women's class, age, and religion intersect with gender in shaping their narratives of sexual harassment. Uh, moreover, uh, in the context of Bangladesh, the existing scholarship is largely uncritical of NGO interventions in Bangladesh on violence against women. These studies fail to question how donors impact, how Western donors impact NGO activities and how these activities do not often consider women's interest in designing sexual harassment prevention uh, or awareness raising projects. Therefore, following post-colonial and decolonial feminist perspectives, my study takes a critical stance on NGO sexual harassment prevention initiatives in Bangladesh and problematizes the impact of Western donors uh, Western donors on NGO activism, which often relies on a deficit victim narrative regarding Bangladeshi women. So what I'm trying to say is because the NGOs in Bangladesh that work on sexual harassment related issues receive funds from Western donors, they often try to satisfy these donors by providing a deficit victim model of Bangladeshi women uh, who are just passive victims who have no autonomy, no agency to challenge sexual harassment. This deficit victim model is also deconstructed in my study with the depiction of 
autonomous digital media centered initiatives undertaken by women in Bangladesh to address sexual harassment on public transport. And I want to uh, address uh, these autonomous digital media interventions by exploring two social media, two Facebook centered sexual uh, harassment prevention initiatives. One, Nari Mohilabas service, and the second one is Gadhishe Darabenna campaign. To dig a deep deeper into the socio-political patriarchal context of Bangladesh that normalizes sexual harassment, let us unpack the terminology of if teasing. As you can see, the title of my thesis had this terminology. If teasing is a colloquial euphemism for sexual harassment in public places and is most commonly used in South Asian countries, both in academic sources and mainstream media. Some examples of these are apparent on the slide. This reference to Eve relates to biblical imagination of Eve as a temptress who caused the fall of man. This connotation draws a connection between sexual harassment in public and moral panic over educated and working women breaching male-dominated public spaces. The use of playful term Eve teasing trivializes sexual harassment. Victim blaming remains at the core of this phrase as it represents the women as a tease who deserve to be disciplined and establishes the idea that the presence of women in public itself is provocative, thus reinforcing the public-private dichotomy. Even in South Asian popular culture, if teasing has been present, represented as a medium of communication between men and women and often if teasing behaviors are treated as fun and romantic in films, thus normalizing the incidence of sexual harassment in public. So it is not at all surprising that until 2009, the legal system in Bangladesh lacked a proper terminology for sexual harassment and used the colloquial term of Eve teasing to refer to the issue of sexual harassment. Now, very briefly, let me I, I, I talk to you about the research methods that I used to conduct my research. My research used qualitative research approach that included live story interviews, semi-structured in-depth interviews, and netnography-based Facebook conversations. The fieldwork uh, occurred for six months in Dhaka city of Bangladesh, and I used both snowball and purposive sampling procedures uh, to recruit my participants. The research participants were divided into three groups. In the first group, I had women commuters. Uh, in the second group, I had NGO workers uh, from five selected NGOs. In the third group, I had government officials working in the Ministry of Women and Children Affairs in Bangladesh. Uh, the data collection process occurred in three stages. At the first stage, I um, recruited the participants from Group 1 and conducted 11 live story interviews with women commuters from Group 1. Then I tried to build a rapport with women social media activists using the process of netrographic Facebook conversation and found seven uh, participants with whom then I engaged with seven live story interviews. In the second stage, I uh, interviewed, I conducted semi-structured interviews with NGO officials from the five selected NGOs and six semi-structured interviews with government officials. In the third and final stage of my data collection, uh, I arranged a data dissemination seminar in Dhaka City and invited my participants from group one, two, and three and shared my data with them uh, by do and did a final editing of the data. Now, let me delve into the findings of my research. Uh, women's narratives, let me unpack women's narratives of sexual harassment and explain how performing of respectability in the public sphere results in women's understanding of sexual harassment on public transport. My uh, study uncovers the close interconnection between women's perceptions of respectability and their understanding of sexual harassment. Their study explains how 
through their understanding and repetitive performances of respectable feminine values, norms, and behaviors, Bangladeshi women create a specific cultural interpretation of the causes, perpetration, and victimization of sexual harassment in the public sphere in Bangladesh. I explored that women's class status, religious affiliation, and age intersect not only to influence the extent to which women accept, challenge, and negotiate with respectability, but to determine how they explain sexual harassment, apportion blame for it, and protest during sexual harassment incidents. Bangladeshi women's understanding of ideal womenhood depends on, the, uh, on their understanding and negotiation of the norms of respectability. The practices and understandings of respectable femininity in the contemporary Bangladesh are closely associated with middle-class Muslim women's identification as Bhadru Mohila, which can be commonly translated as gentle women or respectable women. This understanding of female respectability in Bangladesh has a colonial legacy. The emergence of the idea of Bhadra Mohila in colonial Bengal demonstrates the classed and gendered notion of respectability, which was a direct outcome of colonial rule in the Indian subcontinent. The Victorian idealization of female respectability respectability was ironically appropriated by anti-colonial nationalists in the Indian subcontinent. Uh, scholars such as Partha Chatterjee in 1989 explained how anti-colonial nationalists in the Indian subcontinent attempted to differentiate women in colonial India from Western women. The Bhadra Mohilas or respectable women in India were expected to acquire both formal and cultural education to strengthen their domestic virtues, such as chastity, self-sacrifice, submission, devotion, kindness, patience, and labors of care to attain respectability. However, what the nationalists fail to understand is how little their idea of respectable femininity differed from the Victorian image of perfect lady. The notion of respectable femininity introduced in the colonial era continues to shape the gendered and classed notion of ideal womanhood in contemporary Bangladesh. Domesticity, sexual morality, modest dressing, use of appropriate language in the public domain are some of the important criteria for respectability in the greater Indian subcontinent. These principles of domesticity Empathy, care, sexual morality, and modesty not only shaped the concept of respectable femininity in Bangladesh, but also influenced the normative understanding of respectability, which in turn affects women's engagement with and enactment of gender roles and behaviors in various social contexts. Consequently, this impacts their perceptions of their experiences of sexual harassment in public transport. Upper class women with their luxurious lifestyle have very limited experiences of traveling by public buses, which was specifically clear from my interviews with upper class women in Bangladesh such as Roma and Rehnoba. Rehnoma told me that it had been 10 years since she last traveled by bus. These women's lack of personal experiences of sexual harassment resulted in them depending on mass media to formulate their opinions of sexual harassment. As a result, uh, as discussed before, the media do not acknowledge the spectrum of harassment and just focus on sensational incidents. As a result, Rehnuma was not able to differentiate rape from sexual harassment incidents. On the contrary, middle and working class women in Bangladesh have to depend on public buses for their everyday commute and so they have more experiences and more thoughts regarding sexual harassment on public buses. My study reveals that older women, irrespective of class and religion in their narratives of sexual harassment, 
demonstrated acceptance of normative standards of respectability, such as gender division of labor within the household, public-private divide, prioritization of women's household work, women's adherence to respectable and modest dress codes in public, and use of appropriate language. These women also argued about dealing with sexual harassment in public in a respectable way. This include wearing hijab or porda to avoid being provocative in public, limiting access, uh, limiting their access to public space and avoiding talking or arguing with men in public. For example, Nasima, a 50-year-old Muslim domestic worker, while talking about her understanding of sexual harassment victimhood say, you can't clap with one hand. Men are bad, but women are most at fault for sexual harassment because women have become very modern. They wear modern clothes like tightly fitted jeans and t-shirts. They try to seduce men with their attire and gestures. They openly chit chat and room with men. If you engage with all these improper behaviors, you can't expect that no man will do bad things with you. This statement by Nasima is a classic example of blaming women for sexual harassment incidents, which reflect on older women's understanding not only of the ideal feminine performance of modest dressing, but also the expected masculine behaviors. Although all the women participants identified men as perpetrators of sexual harassment, not all of them considered men to be fully responsible for sexual harassment. Heterosexuality and sexual prowess construct the normative standards of hegemonic masculinity in Bangladesh. As a result, instead of blaming men who cannot control their innate qualities of sexual aggression, Rehnuma, Roma, Nasima, and my other older research participants directly blamed women who break the norms of respectability by immodest dressing that triggers male's predatory sexual behaviors. In other words, older, upper, middle, and most working class women's understanding of sexual harassment in Bangladesh relies on the premise that it is women's responsibility to recognize the dangers of man's natural predatory sexual behaviors and to take precautions against them. These precautionary measures include practicing respectable feminine gestures such as avoiding public buses altogether, limiting public travel alone at night, dressing modestly and maintaining porta. It is also noticeable how the participant hesitated to use the term sexual harassment. Her uneasiness to use this terminology was clear from her gestures. Sexuality and the use of sexually related terms remain taboo in Bangladesh. Therefore, for the fear of harming their respectable feminine identity, many older women like Nasima, when answering questions about their sexual harassment experiences, either maintained awkward silences and mumbled or replaced the term sexual harassment with terms like indecent activities and bad behavior. Some of them even requested that I turn off the recording for a time being so that they could narrate their perceptions of sexual harassment without the fear of breaking the norm of modesty of a bhadru mohila who must avoid vulgar terms like sexual harassment. In existing feminist literature on women's movement in Bangladesh, Young middle class and upper class women with better access to modern higher education, paid employment, uh, and information about global feminist activism have been identified as the new women who possess the capacity to break out the traditional gender roles. These new women who, propo uh, who possesses the capacity to break out the traditional gender um, roles can both challenge and negotiate norms of respectability. As a result, uh, as a result, these women, unlike older women, were able to clearly narrate their personal experiences of sexual harassment, rejected victim blaming, and argued for women's freedom to choose their dresses, challenged the uh, hierarchical gender relations system both within and outside their houses, and stated the necessity to protest sexual harassment. 
For example, when asked about sexual harassment, Molly, a 22-year-old Muslim student, narrated the story of how a few days ago, two men on a motorbike suddenly grabbed her stole and threw it several feet away while she was trying to cross the road at her university campus. As she bent down to pick up the stole, one of the, riber, uh, one of the riders spat on her face and they sped off. She explained with horror how her glasses were smeared with spit, how she stood there frozen with humiliation, unable to move until a friend noticed her and helped her cross the road. Molly, although was vocal about her experiences of harassment, she also instinctively engaged in repetitive performances of modesty and respectability while dealing with sexual harassment. I heard Molly's experiences of sexual harassment while sitting at a cafe at her university. From where we sat, Molly was able to point towards the busy intersection where her stool was snatched by the perpetrators. She herself identified this incident as a disgraceful event that was a transgression of her integrity and personal space. When describing the incident, this jolly-minded, outspoken woman suddenly started talking in a timid voice to avoid attracting the attention of other customers in the cafe for fear of her modesty being questioned. Her appreciation for modesty was also visible in her action of running towards the throne stool. When her stool was taken and thrown, she was so shaken that she did not hesitate to run into the middle of the busy road to regain it. She even failed to notice that perpetrators were waiting there to further harass her. Molly also did not share her experience with her family as she felt this would make her parents worry for her safety and might impose restrictions on her access to public life. Although she hesitated to share the incident with her family, she did share the incident in a Facebook post restricted to her Facebook friends. It was due to her post that she was referred to me as a potential research participant by one of my other participants. Once we became Facebook friends, I was able to go through her Facebook post where after detailing the event, Molly provided five bullet points and in bold font highlighted five aspects of her experience. She explained how she was not inside a, a crowded bus all by herself and not in a risky place at night. She was dressed in a modest way by wearing a stole and the incident happened at 10 a.m. in broad daylight in front of the high court. During her interview, she explained that she shared her experience on Facebook to raise awareness among women. Even though she understood that her respectability was at risk of scrutiny if her story became public. As a result, she not only restricted the post to her Facebook friends, but mentioned those specific points within the post in order to ensure that her actions that they could not be seen as violating the ethical standards of modesty and sexual morality. Molly grew up in a middle-class family in Dhaka where she had always been taught to nurture and value respectable feminine behavior. Therefore, Molly being a new woman of 21st century with access to formal education and global information about feminist activism was able to give voice to her sexual harassment experience. At the same time, because she was motivated by virtues of respectability taught to her by her family, she by reflex engaged in performances of respectability both during the incident and after in interpreting the experience by describing her socially acceptable attire and actions in the Facebook post. Whereas interviews with Muslim participants showed that older Muslim women less frequently experience harassment on buses than young Muslim women Older Hindu women's experiences are somewhat different. As their religious identity can easily be revealed from their nuptial signs they wear, older married Hindu women more frequently fall victim to sexual harassment on buses. 
For example, Rekha, a 40-year-old Hindu middle-class woman, experienced how her nuptial signs like Shindu and Shakha Pola um, makes her uh, further, like makes her identity as a Hindu woman visible and further stigmatizes her in public transport. Therefore, she always prefers to avoid wearing them if she is traveling by public buses or would hide her nuptial signs uh, with hair and wear long sleeves to hide her shaka pola. Whereas Muslim women argued that performance of religious values and norms such as wearing porda can be effective ways for women to avoid sexual harassment on public buses. This statement by a Hindu woman shows how older Hindu women generally avoid performances of their religious traditions to be safe from sexual harassment on public buses. Moreover, in my interviews with Bangladeshi working class women, I found that working class flower seller Rahima demonstrated the capacity not only to negotiate several norms of respectability, but also to protest sexual harassment. Rohima's ability to negotiate with the norms of respectability was apparent from her comment on her personal experiences of harassment, domesticity, and gender division of labor and uh, women's rights. In short, the findings of this study suggest that the although women commuters experience sexual harassment on buses irrespective of age, religion, and class identity, in short, the findings of this study suggest that although women commuters experience sexual harassment on buses, irrespective of their age, religion, and class identity, women's class, age, and religion intersect to create their individual per perceptions of sexual harassment. Therefore, to successfully address sexual harassment on public buses, sexual harassment prevention interventions need to be all-inclusive and take into account the diverse narratives of women. Therefore, to explore how the existing sexual harassment prevention initiatives in the country address women's qualitative narratives, my study next critically investigates NGO-led sexual harassment prevention interventions in Bangladesh. This study establishes a direct relationship between the limited scope of NGO sexual harassment prevention interventions and the interest of Western donors. Within the time frame of my research, that is 2017 to 2018, 2,308 local or internationally registered NGOs worked in Bangladesh. Scholars have generally welcomed the growing dependence of Bangladesh on NGO operations for delivery of basic services including relief, rehabilitation, health, education, development programs, peace, human rights, environment, gender inequality, and empowerment to poor communities in remote areas. Some even claim that Bangladesh's move from an um, unpromising start as a busted case to its present remarkable progress in poverty reduction and sustainable economic growth is due to NGOs' increasing use of foreign aid to reach rural masses, and this is why NGOs have often been termed as the magic bullets of development for the country. In the contemporary period, scholars have commended NGOs for leading women's movement from the front to promote women's empowerment and gender equality in Bangladesh through their introduction of microcredit for employment, our income generation, campaigns for free education and reproductive health rights, and numerous violence prevention interventions. While the online information on the activities of most of the NGOs working in Bangladesh show that they have projects on either women empowerment or violence against women that vaguely incorporate the issue of sexual harassment in their activism, only BRAC and Action Aid had projects that directly address sexual harassment of women on public transport. Hence, for the purpose of this research, I chose to focus on five NGOs. Um, three of which focus on sexual harassment to some extent, and the remaining two, that is BRAC and Action Aid, specifically focuses on women's experience of sexual harassment on public transport. Um, now let's unpack the NGO donor relationship in Bangladesh. 
NGO management in Bangladesh follows a top-down approach in which Western donor bodies control NGOs' ability to address specific violence against women prevention interventions. The donor-NGO relationship moves between a demand and supply-led approach. In a demand-led situation, NGOs have full control over decisions about projects and their implementation, while donors finance the projects planned and designed by NGOs. Today, most interventions depend on supply-led contracts with, uh, with donors. Donors control NGO interventions by directing funds at specific programs where the objectives, goals, and outcomes have already been set by donors. Since numerous NGOs are dealing with similar issues, international donors often take advantage of the increased competition for their money to compel fund recipient NGOs to design and implement projects to specifically satisfy donor interests. This establishes a hierarchical power relationship where donors set program objectives and NGO implement them and are expected to send back information to the donor in the form of reports and evaluations. However, depending on the size of the NGOs in terms of their geographical coverage and internal resources, their relationship with donors vary between demand-led and supply-led approaches. Small local NGOs like MJF or Manusha Juno Foundation have fewer internal resources and depend completely on Western donor bodies for funding and are forced to maintain supply-led contracts with donors. Large international NGOs like BRAC, on the other hand, have both international connections and internal resources to source funding from diverse donors and in many cases can arrange demand-led contracts with their donors. Nevertheless, as numerous NGOs compete with one another for limited funds in both demand-led and supply-led situations, donors exercise some level of control over NGOs' interventions. This can range from designing projects to outlining their implementation and outcome dissemination strategies. My personal experience of working at the United Nations Development Program uh, in Bangladesh resonates with this. I worked with UNDP Bangladesh's Sexual and Gender-Based Violence Project, which aimed to address violence against women in seven selected districts in Bangladesh. The project was funded by Korean government from 2014 to 2016. As a junior level employee, I noticed my senior colleagues' continual efforts to please the donors with their success stories. While creating each quarterly report of the project, my colleagues and I were encouraged by our senior colleagues to highlight the project's success in achieving donor-specific objectives. However, despite all our efforts to promote these success stories, this project only received funding for running the first phase of its initiative and could not roll out the second phase after 2016, even though at that time, uh, this SGVV project was the only project looking at violence against women in Bangladesh. As the findings of my study suggest, very few NGO-led uh, in violence prevention projects deal with sexual harassment on public transport. This is due to partly a shift in attention from Western donors towards humanitarian and disaster relief work and partly to the cultural context that make NGO employees trivialize the issue of sexual harassment on public transport. As you can see on the slide, there is a quotation from a uh, um, NGO official from UN Women who did not consider sexual harassment on public transport important enough to address by UN Women. The uh, dominant modes of NGO interventions to prevent sexual or prevent violence against women, therefore, are limited to educational training sessions, legal advocacy works, and awareness raising activities for addressing sexual harassment in the controlled institutional settings of workplaces, schools, and universities. They inadequately address women's class, age, and religion-specific sexual harassment needs. Therefore, their target audience is usually comprised of middle-class educated women, Working-class women, such as Rohima, representing the majority of those who use public transport and consequently experience the uh, sexual harassment the most on buses, rarely benefit from these initiatives.
Moreover, to satisfy donors' requirements of quantifiable, measurable success, NGOs generate, uh, pro generally produce quantitative studies overlooking Bangladeshi women's qualitative narratives of sexual harassment, failing to address the diverse needs of women who experience sexual harassment. Instead, to attract Western donors' funding, NGOs employ a one-dimensional portrayal of poor, vulnerable, and victim Bangladeshi women unaware of the seriousness of sexual harassment. Although a local NGO, Manushir Jano Foundation, attempted to take into account women's narratives to determine the safety parameters of public spaces in their sexual harassment prevention initiative, donors' lack of interest resulted in a premature end to this initiative. Therefore, while educated middle-class women are the primary targets of NGO violence prevention initiatives, many of my young middle-class research participants, such as Sumaya, Monica, and Nisha, were completely unaware of these initiatives. Clearly then, the politics of donor funding and the top-down modes of NGO's governments result in education and training-centric sexual harassment prevention in initiatives are poor proxies for empowerment and poor measures of successfully challenging sexual harassment. As a result, they fail to represent women and women's interests both culturally and politically. While there is a lack of coalition between NGOs to launch collective actions to address sexual harassment, as well as apathy about documenting women's voices to uh, res uh, resistance to satisfy Western donors' gaze to helpless Bangladeshi women, Bangladeshi women have engaged in sexual harassment prevention activism on social media to resist sexual harassment on public buses. The following discussion will critically examine uh, two such social media initiatives. In the final part of my research, I attempted to debunk the myth of all third world women being homogeneous, powerless, poor, uneducated, tradition bound, and victim category as suggested by Western feminist scholarships by exploring autonomous social media initiatives led by Bangladeshi women. For this purpose, my study delves into two social media-centered sexual harassment prevention initiatives, Nari Mohila Bus Service and Ga Heshe Dara Benna. To investigate the extent to which Facebook can be used as a platform for feminist organizing against violence against women in the patriarchal socio-cultural context of Bangladesh. Nari Mohila Bus Service is a, well, a women-only Facebook group with 836 general members and two administrators, which was created to raise money for launching women-only bus services to the major Dhaka city routes to ensure women's safe travel in the city. Gagishe Daravenna is a young Bangladeshi entrepreneur's attempt to raise the awareness of the sexual harassment of women on public buses by designing hairpins and t-shirts containing the Gagheshe Daravenna tagline, which can be translated as don't stand too close. Like Nari Mohila Bus Service, Gagheshe Daravenna also relied on Facebook to popularize the tagline and to grow collective consciousness around the issue. In, uh, in the patriarchal, social, legal, and media context in Bangladesh, sexual harassment is considered a, a trivial and taboo issue, as discussed before. The legal system in Bangladesh rarely addresses the issue of sexual harassment. Police often either mock the complainant for complaining a minor issue like sexual harassment um, or uh, uh, question the authenticity by questioning the complainant's respectable femininity. As discussed before, very few government and NGO initiatives address sexual harassment on public buses. Openly sharing sexual harassment experience is also considered immodest and disrespectful. Mainstream um, media in Bangladesh also fail to consider everyday sexual harassment incidents on public buses as extreme or sensational enough to be covered. Bangladeshi women therefore turn to social media, which at least offers them relative anonymity, thus a comparatively safer platform on which they can narrate their stories of harassment. Founders of both the social media initiatives I am discussing felt that Facebook's promise of sociability and free and easy communication 
would allow women to bond quickly over their shared interest in addressing sexual harassment. Now let's unpack how Nari Mohila Bus Service worked in creating a sense of solidarity. The founder of this Facebook initiative motivated group members to share their narratives of harassment on the group with the hope that this would lead women to feel connected enough to support the collective endeavor of women-only buses. Many participants considered Facebook group as a safe space to first open up about their experiences of harassment. By the time they were actually having this discussion, if as you all remember, Me Too was very popular in the West and across the globe. Several participants confirmed that sharing their stories on social media enabled them to create direct personal ties with other sexual harassment victims based on their shared frustration and anger. Repeated discussions of sexual harassment experiences raised collective feminist consciousness in women to engage in politics of visibility, which enabled them not only to make such unheard experiences of harassment visible, but to challenge the hegemonic social norms that discourage women from openly talking about the taboo issue of harassment. By popularizing the slogan Gaghese Dara Benna, uh, which can be translated as Don't Stand Too Close, the founder of this campaign, Nisha, was attempting to draw attention to the growing cases of sexual harassment incidents on buses. She was promoting t-shirts for women, an attire that goes against the standards of respectable feminine clothing in the country. She therefore experienced significant backlash from mainstream media, social media users and the police. The images of models wearing t-shirts went viral and were used by misogynists to create other fake images where the tagline don't stand too close was replaced with offensive sentences. Reporters from both mainstream and digital media falsely accused Nisha of promoting vulgarity. Police questioned her intentions and she received numerous rape and death threats on social media. However, despite this public and media backlash, she also received countless notes of support from family, friends, and anonymous Facebook users. According to Nisha, the stories, condolences, and support she received from strangers across the country to her Facebook Messenger inbox made her feel a sense of connection and solidarity with these women. Now, um, let us question social media and the solidarity possible through it. The prior discussion established the need for listening to women's narratives and experiences of harassment to design successful sexual harassment initiatives. However, can telling stories of harassment on digital platforms like Facebook create a long-term solidarity against sexual harassment? My findings demonstrate that social media prompted solidarity in both the cases of Nari Mohilabha service and Gadhishe Dharabenna uh, are weaker forms of solidarity for a number of reasons. The Facebook group's lack of strategic planning placed uncontested confidence in Facebook's ability to, con to create solidarity out of sharing stories of violence without acknowledging how Facebook's profit-driven structure commodifies these stories. In addition, participants of these initiatives lacked experiences of grassroots-level political or organizing. Depending only on the commonality of shared sexual harassment or solidarity building, while failing to take into consideration differences in understandings of respectability and sexual harassment. The interview findings also suggest that only a selected group of middle class, mostly Muslim women in their 20s or early 30s who possess social and economic capital could be a part of this digital activism. However, social media still has the capacity to amplify women's marginalized voices to shed light on the so-called trivial issue of sexual harassment on public buses. Both the initiatives, therefore, demonstrate examples of powerful practices in the politics of visibility that shifted hegemonic respectable feminine discourse of how it present, interpret, and respond to the taboo issue of sexual violence.
Now I will conclude my uh, lecture by giving some concluding remarks. As neither the rigid donor controlled corporatist and quantitative modes of NGO led interventions nor women's qualitative story based autonomous social media initiatives are sufficiently inclusive or empowering we must ask how to initiate effective, empowering, and comprehensive sexual harassment prevention initiatives. I Therefore, I believe we need a groundswell of collective feminist actions involving both online and offline protests against rape culture and sexual harassment to successfully address the sexual harassment of women in Bangladesh. Such activism would attempt to include women from diverse backgrounds to raise collective awareness of women's diverse needs. In the era of cyber feminism, despite many critics of social media centered women's movements, we must acknowledge that social media offers women a chance to engage in a politics of visibility to challenge hegemonic gender stereotypes and rape culture. Therefore, I argue that an empowering and effective feminist activism should make use of social media to gather participants, promote its agenda and organize marches and protests offline in order to challenge the hegemonic socio-cultural structures in which women's experiences of sexual harassment are normalized. Thank you, everyone. I'll now welcome any questions that you might have about the research. I do have a question that came to mind myself. Um, you were saying towards the end that these uh, initiatives, like the T-shirts and so on, would only have be able to be used, and also social media, and only be used by um, middle class um, Muslim women with education. Um, can you explain why they would not be accessible to other groups or religions? Okay. First of all, um, to have like uh, you need to have certain form of social and economic capital to even have a computer, even have a phone to access social media. So economic issue, so class issue is of course a thing. And the other thing is to use social media to participate in this globally popular Me Too campaign and then uh, writing about their experiences of sexual harassment on uh, on social media needs a certain form of education. So it might not be accessible for working class women. And as I have mentioned, in terms of religion, um, religious minority groups are specifically stigmatized in cases of harassment. In any cases of violence um, in uh, uh, Islamic fundamentalist country like Bangladesh. So Hindu women, even if they are experiencing harassment, they will not necessarily talk about those issues in a public platform like social media, like you from um, the group, as I said, the group uh, nearly had 900 members. And a couple of the members, of course, were Hindu women. But I have never seen any Hindu women uh, writing anything about their sexual harassment experiences. Even some of the women I interviewed were um, um, some members of that group I interviewed were Hindu women. And they said that they feel like if they're writing about this stuff on social media, uh, because uh, they don't necessarily have the religious uh, guiding of wearing for that and which uh, considers that modest dressing. So in many cases, the dress they wear might be considered immodest. So their experiences of sexual harassment might not be validated enough on social media. Um, I, your research is fabulous and wonderful, and it is uh, a treat to listen to. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I think we've talked about that before, so I should <laughs> repeat that. Um, yeah, so I was, I was thinking about it, and I was kind of um, thinking about some work that I myself have done with, uh, with young people, but specifically with young migrants, uh, and kind of social media and political education. Um, and kind of two thoughts popped into my head, and... One was about how, when I was in conversation with young people about how they're using our social media to yeah, kind of engage in political discourse, one of the things that kind of came out of the discussion was they had the sense that like 
they could see the flow of ideas online, mm -hmm. but they actually had to bring everything offline uh, to engage in their own kind of re-education. Um, and so I'm wondering if maybe similar things came up. Uh, and then related to that, um, I had this wonderful conversation with a young Sudanese woman who told me she was from rural Sudan and she told me all about how she like learned English and then read all these novels mm. and it, all of these novels are about like women gaining access to education and it was so inspiring to her that she strategically planned her higher education uh, so that she didn't have to get married <laughs> Uh, and so it became a practice of resistance for her. Uh, and so I'm kind of curious if any of the women who you're engaging with, um, how they learned about their, like, to engage in practices of resistance and where that came from. Sorry, there's a, that was a lot. Um, okay. Um, can I ask you to, like, because there is a, like, uh, in brief, if you could again repeat the question. Um Maybe if you can just speak more generally to how some of these young women um, started to think about their own resistance or if they were resisting um, and what kind of influenced that. Um, see, in terms of women's um, resistance, I only looked at the social media resistance, you know, and the time frame of my research was 2017 to 2018. And we know that like the Me Too hashtag was very much popular in those times. So they were clearly influenced by those sort of initiatives. But as I said, there is a very much gap in women's understanding of sexual harassment and the ability to actually collectively protest uh, sexual harassment um, using social media or any forms of other offline activism in the context of Bangladesh. Like these working class women, they are continuously experiencing sexual harassment because they are um, the one who are using public transport most frequently. But they, I, they have never been part of any form of this sort of collective resistance towards sexual harassment. And this is one of the major critique of feminist movement in Bangladesh. In most cases, these feminist movements are led by NGOs. And NGO is actually used synonymous to women's development, women's empowerment in the country without so properly acknowledging how these NGOs itself are run by Western donor agencies. And so they are actually trying to satisfy donors' interests, not necessarily diverse women's needs. So as I said in my lecture, and I also uh, uh, ex like experienced in my research, that NGOs are basically going from a top-down approach. Yeah, yeah, like the donors are telling, okay, we think these are the interesting or appropriate projects for women in Bangladesh. So you need to add, uh, like, uh, create projects in that way. As a result, none of the women I interviewed, even if uh, they are from middle class or working class, were experiencing sexual harassment every day. They have no clue of this, uh, all these initiatives of violence prevention happening by these NGOs. All they know about NGO activism well, is like NGOs are working for um, issues like reproductive health care. Am I making sense? Because when NGOs are going to working class women, they are just um, advertising these reproductive health care products. That's all they are doing because they, they feel like, uh, like because of being motivated by satisfying Western donor interests, for them, the only issues uh, uh, women, working class women are experiencing is they are uh, uh, having a huge number of reproduction issue, like they are just giving birth to lots of children. That's the only issue working class women are experiencing. So they are only going to working class women, not asking about any other problem they're experiencing like domestic violence or sexual harassment and designing projects on the basis of that. Rather, they are just going there to advertise their reproductive health care products. You know, thank you, Arunima. Have another question. Thank you, thanks, Arunima. That was a very comprehensive presentation, and yeah, to repeat uh, what Genevieve said, it's a fabulous research. Mm, I'm just trying to think in in line with what Genevieve was saying about the resistance from the side of these women, and I'm trying to think of that quote from I think the UN Women saying that they have other, you know, um, other issues in the country to deal with, maybe 
trying to prioritize other uh, other issues. And like, do you think if we think about these women, do you think that they they are prioritizing also or picking up the battles that they need to fight for? Like, I don't know the context, but do you think that they they have other you know other many responsibilities, many problems in their lives that they really need to pick up other battles than sexual harassment? Can be this like can we? try to look more uh, closely at at this part. And, um, you know, the statistics of violence against women in... Yeah, yeah, yeah. This is the thing, that yes, do we have any statistics about the incidents of rape that happens on the buses? Because still I can't imagine this happening, like yes, sexual harassment, but do we have any statistics about actual rape? incidents happening on the bus. Yeah, thank you. Okay, first of all, I'll um, answer that question on the statistics. Um, um, so, like the time frame of my research from 2017 to 2018, a report by Jatri Kollan Shramiti, that is um, uh, Passengers Welfare Society in Bangladesh, they say, uh, investigated and found that in one year, 20 women were, were ra either raped or gang raped on public transport in Bangladesh. And of course, like the, like the statistics of sexual, statistics of all violence in Bangladesh is very much horrifying. But why I was interested in the issue of sexual harassment is because of my personal experience. So this uh, statement that you were referring to that was mentioned by one of the NGO workers who said like in Bangladesh we have so many other issues to deal with rather than a sexual harassment. But when I asked my research participants, they necess did not necessarily agree with that. For them, because who are uh, like going, uh, using public transport every day and the status and experiencing sexual harassment each and every day. And the issues are very much horrifying, like cutting dress uh, from behind, masturbation on public transport. Um, so all these issues are so much horrifying that they feel like, of course, this is an important issue issue to be dealt with but unfortunately very few NGOs very few government initiatives are actually focusing on this issue rather they are considering that there are so many other issues to deal with you know and as you mentioned like if it's a battle to um, like their own battle to fight so I considered this like because I when um, I was an undergraduate student every day when I was commuting by public transport being a middle class woman going to university every day transporting by public transport and have numerous experiences of sexual harassment on public transport I felt that this is my responsibility this is my battle to take so this is why I became interested in investing investigating that and I was also an undergraduate student of women and gender studies which gave me much uh, exposure to feminist theories to unpack this issue. But what is the alliance the, the topic for the need for this activism? It's just to try to uh, focus on the one that they've said, so not to focus on their agency. Mm. No, 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 I understand. I completely understand. So I just, I was just trying to explain, like, as you said, like, for different women, there might be different um, violence issues that might be more severe, you know, like the upper class women who are experienced, who have no idea of public transport or who never uh, board on public transport, never experienced sexual harassment, they might not be interested in uh, unpacking this issue. For them, there might be so many other uh, issues of violence that they might be interested in. And in many cases, they could not even differentiate between rape and sexual harassment. But for working class or middle class women, this is something very important, just like it was important to me that motivated me to do that work. Thank you. Uh, thanks for the passionate presentation. Uh, we have a lot of thank yous and uh, some uh, people used to share some links. So Louise mentioned that her daughter shared some, sh some, um, some links with her. And she also got a question, why does there seem to be no efforts to hold the perpetrators 
accountable for their bad behavior. So she got some suggestions, you know, empower them, educate them, all sort of things. Uh, then we got Jane, Jane talking about her qualifications, and she was working 40 years in this field. Then one more question from Shishir Chandra. Is there any relation between sexual harassment and moral education? Okay. Uh, so just to recap, because there was a few questions there. So the first question was from Louise. Um, from one of our online participants, why does there seem to be no efforts to hold the perpetrators accountable? Okay. So as I said, like the issue of sexual harassment because of the socio-political and patriarchal structure of Bangladesh, the issue of sexual harassment is very much normalized, trivialized and excused and it is like it is embedded in the legal system in the police in every part of the social institutions in bangladesh like the legal system still today do not have a proper uh, like punishment structured there for sexual harassment happening on public transport so of course police are not taking the complaints of sexual harassment seriously so this is, this issue is far more complicated and embedded in the normalized and trivialized understanding of sexual harassment as not a very important issue. So I think that's one of the major reasons why the perpetrators in many of these cases are not held accountable until the sexual harassment issues are uh, converted into rape incidents. Thank you. And if we can jump to the next question, which was, is there any relation between sexual harassment and moral education? Uh, more like the, in terms of moral education, um, in the context of us, uh, in the context of Bangladesh, the moral education, especially for women, is very much related to the understanding of Bhadra Mohila, the term I use, the idea of respectable womenhood. So the moral education basically teaches women to behave morally, to uphold their uh, sexual morality, to dress properly, modestly in public spaces, not be aggressive in the public space and all this. So the moral education is not about holding the perpetrator responsible or teaching them about not harassing women. Rather, it's the responsibility of women in Bangladesh to not attract unnecessary attention. So this is very problematic. So this is why like I try to relate the understanding of female respectability in relation to sexual harassment because how women understand female respectability, practice norms of respectability basically creates their understanding of sexual harassment and how they would uh, like react during experiences of sexual harassment. Thank you. Okay, we've got more, uh, a lot of, comments coming in it's going wild on the chat here um carrie robinson says this is very interesting and important thank you so much i look forward to reading more um louise l says i'm so sorry for your experience i believe you i had a similar experience 25 years ago on a train in sydney my daughter tells me about her uncomfortable experiences traveling via public transport these days quite concerning book to hear for me as a mother uh, Jane says, can I add and say that the importance of this work is providing a space for the most powerless women in Bangladesh to tell their stories and lead change from the bottom up. So lots of positive comments coming in for you, yeah, yeah. Uh, Dr. Das. And thank you so much for today. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. Thank you. It has been an honor to present here and especially in front of my PhD supervisor, uh, Professor Alana Lentin, who has actually shaped the whole project. And all I am today is basically because of her. <laughs> that is completely true. Thank you. Thank you.